Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. Millions died during the first attacks. A few people fled to underground vaults, but many more on the surface fell victim to the burning, poisonous air. The opening cinematic is surprisingly well done. But the narrator isn't Ron Perlman, making it the first time he didn't voice an opening in the franchise. But it is Tony Jay who played the lieutenant in the first game. The Brotherhood of Steel, self-appointed knights of the Wasteland. It portrays the Brotherhood as self-appointed heroes of the Wasteland, even though they've been primarily depicted as isolationist tech hoarders in previous games. It had a very small budget, forcing the developers to make the intro using only stock footage and art from previous games. But they were clever about it. For example, transposing the main characters onto a piece of concept art from Tactics. A happy electron, a neutron is made. Don't give a damn about apocalyptic fate. The song on the main menu is a legit jam, and in my opinion, the best main menu track in the franchise. Couch Co-op, the only time that's happened in the series. A Goal Protagonist, also the only time that's ever happened in an official title. Also the first time you couldn't at least somewhat customize your character and traits are gone completely. The characters do have different abilities and advantages, though. For example, Kane can heal himself in radiation and Nadia can get a dog companion. The image for the latter skill, a man's best friend, would later reappear in New Vegas. The post-nuclear guide to intimacy promotional video that came alongside the game. Deep in the wasteland lies the small town of Carmen. It opens in Carbon, Texas, to you searching for a group of Brotherhood Paladins, making it the only game to be set in the state. It was heavily criticized during development, most harshly by fans on the websites Duck and Cover and No Mutants Allowed, both of which are cheekily referenced in the intro and credits. The intro cinematic sets a serious tone that's almost immediately undercut by an indulgent slow motion kill and goofy sound effects. Wait, you can't do this. We shut your mouth, worm, before I step on you. A lady leader of raiders who dresses like Betty Page and talks like a dominatrix, opposed to wearing actual armor and having any interesting qualities as a character. Hey. Where's Frank? Still in the bar. He'll catch up later. Come on. Incompetent henchmen who sound like Italian mobsters. The camera angle is set 50 feet in the air and is framed almost straight down, making it hard to see what characters or levels even look like. The ambient music in Carbon is great. My name's Ruby. I'm what you might call an entertainer. The first character you talk to is a prostitute. More Italian mobsters. The town's restaurant is named the Atomic Diner. Simplistic but fun beat-em-up combat. Punching a guy so hard his head explodes. If you play as the ghoul, he says, Yeah! Every few melee attacks. Yeah! Yeah! He Naruto runs if you don't have a weapon equipped. My real name is Arnold, but everyone calls me Armpit. So what? I'm just an honest guy selling rot gut liquor to the sad schmucks in this town. The bartender's name is Armpit, and he mentions rot gut from the classic games. So, partner, for every red scorpion tail you bring me, <coughs> I'll pay you a few caps. He gives you a side quest to bring him rat scorpion tails, which is similar to a quest in the first game where the player brings a tail to Razlo. You can't kill him or any of the other NPCs in town. A poster that breaks the fourth wall by mentioning the title of the game. 
Developers struggling against console memory limits is a tale as old as time. And a text string in the game files reads, Out of fucking memory. The financial news at Interplay was tightening and they took several brand deals to stay afloat. One of which would lead to Nuka-Cola being replaced by a real-world energy drink called Balls. This is often considered to be one of the worst aspects of the title, but real brands had been featured in previous games many times, including Glock, Beretta, H&K, Winchester, FN, VW, etc. Considering this wasn't the first time a real brand was introduced, I think it's pretty funny. I used to belong to a group called the Followers of the Apocalypse, but that didn't work out. Followers of the Apocalypse reference. This reaction to you being a ghoul. Well, either you're a ghoul or someone set fire to your face and put it out with a rake. If you let the Pip Boy screen idle long enough, it plays a screensaver of the bombs falling during the Great War. A nice homage to the screensaver that came alongside the first game. Balls Bottle Caps. There's a general lack of retrofuturism, and the city is more of a generic post-apocalyptic setting. Why don't we just leave Carbon? Go live somewhere else. Yeah, where? Every other place is either glowing or destroyed. Well, there's gotta be some place better than this. Oh, I wish I could believe that. Some of the conversations between NPCs are great. You can call the mayor a fuckface. Now you need to kill 57 rad scorpions inside of a warehouse, which just feels excessive. Enemies who clip through walls. Death animations where enemies explode into chunks of meat. Then you fight a rad scorpion boss, and all the songs used in boss fights are instrumental tracks from bands like Slipknot and Chimera. While this music works well for an action game, it harshly contradicts the series' retrofuturism. The design of the scorpion boss is pretty great, though. Despite featuring new metal and boss fights, the ambient soundtrack is much better than I expected. The mayor now tells you the Brotherhood Paladins went into a nearby location called the Crater. A giant crater from the Great War that much of Carbon has collapsed into, and it's an awesome area concept. It is only fitting that you die here, stranger. You descend into the lowest part of the crater where the mayor betrays you for the raiders and a twist I didn't see coming. A fun boss fight ensues where he unintentionally blows up his own henchmen. The fight takes place in a car henge arena. He explodes when he dies. The crater begins to collapse because of your fight, and you have to fight your way back out and escape before you're crushed. I ain't done nothing wrong. Armpit tries to sell you out to the raiders and gets killed by a flamethrower. While he's dying, you can ask him if he wants to buy more scorpion tails. The flamer is named Flamethrower. The city is now under attack by raiders, and your objective is to kill the attackers and save the townspeople. In theory, you should have to kill the raiders first, but you can just run up to the civilians and press a button. In most cases, causing them to give you an item before magically disappearing. You need to save 37 townspeople, but there's only two character models for all of them. One of the game's secret weapons is dependent on saving all of them, but they can easily die off-screen when you're nowhere near them. Enemies who fly through the air. The car model looks great. Fight Club reference. Map layouts that show multiple paths, but linear level design that forces you to travel through every mission in a very particular way. Enemies who blow themselves up or kill each other by mistake. Don't miss any of the raiders or you'll have to spend a ton of time backtracking to find and kill them. A dead cat is a quest item. The dead cat's name. They killed Mr. Pussy! I think I'm gonna be sick. 
If you sleep with her as a ghoul, you can say, can't handle a little ooze, huh? I had a name once, but not anymore. Heard your name's Cain, just like the first murderer, the brother killer. Do you think of other ghouls as your brothers? Have you killed any brothers lately? You can also meet a mysterious stranger at this point, voiced by Michael Bell, who also voiced Hemlock in Tactics. I'm a stranger, girl. Didn't your folks teach you not to talk to strangers? No. You never knew your folks. You're a child of the bomb, raised by rats, adopted by the noble knights of the Brotherhood. He has unique lines depending on the character you play. Now you take on the raiders at their home turf, culminating in half of a dungeon where the only music is an alarm blaring. All right, you have your orders. You know what to do? Attack anything that moves. Except each other, right? More dominatrix enemies. Their concept art. That half of the concept art for the game is over-sexualized pinups. Akembo weapons. The only time that's ever happened in the series. Mortal Kombat reference. You better not be messing with me, you big- I have nothing to do with it. My troops have gathered the slaves and moved on. Our business is concluded. Tony J, the lieutenant's voice actor, returns to play another super mutant villain. If there's a problem, maybe you can stay and help me out. Then I can help you. Your charms are wasted on me. Frankly, I think you're repulsive, selling your own kind. The raider matron tries to seduce him, but he rejects her. Badly designed boss fight where you can literally just hold a button to win. There was a ghoul city to the west called Necropolis, but that place was wiped out by the mutants. A mention of Necropolis being destroyed by super mutants. What's that you got there, kid? Is that a, a Vault 13 flask? Call me a sentimental old fool, but uh, I'll give you a few caps for it. The mysterious stranger you met earlier reveals himself to be the Vault Dweller, the protagonist of the first game. I think the homage is handled very well, and he even mentions the master, Vault 13 in Necropolis. That is, until you literally fight him to the death in a cage fight later on. Your life ends in the wasteland. It's now canon to me that the Vault Dweller was brutally slain in a cage fight by a random initiate of the Brotherhood. This concept art of the Vault Dweller. If you somehow manage to save all the townspeople, he gives you the Red Rider BB gun from the first game. The city of Loss, a shattered husk of the shining metropolis it once was. Decaying bodies and broken stone give the air a graveyard stench. In the second act, we leave Carbon behind and travel to Loss in search of the Brotherhood, a bombed out city overflowing with radiation that feels very Fallout. Dictates the penalty for trespass, annihilation. Part of the city is controlled by a group called the Church of the Lost, a cult of ghouls who kill anyone who travels into their territory. Well, hello there, Junior. You look like a ghoul who's going places. The name is Harold. What can I do for you today? Harold is back again, making him a returning character in every official title up until this point. He's voiced by Alan Oppenheimer, who played several NPCs in Tactics and Brandis in the fourth game. You found my arm. Let me try and shimmy it back on. He gives a quest to find his missing body parts that can then somehow be reattached to his body. All of the ghoul character models are nightmarish. Perhaps the ghouliest looking ghoul concept art. Whoa! Damn, you freaked me out with that. Ah, that's your face. If you play as Kane, there's a lot of unique dialogue you won't hear as the other characters. 
Most of the city is overrun by insane ghouls, partially made up from the former inhabitants of Necropolis. There's lore stating the dogs and loss are faster because they're hopped up on Psycho. A series of platforming sections were falling results in instant death, followed by a secret weapon that can only be found by jumping off the map into the void in a very specific spot. A gun that fires exploding pieces of meat. Enemies who shoot you from off screen when you can't even see them. Well then, a package from my esteemed brother. You have my thanks for transporting it here, lowly courier. A merchant gives you a package to give to his brother and fellow merchant, which turns out to be a bomb that kills his brother because he wanted to take out the competition, resulting in a fun side quest. A gladiatorial pet with 20 different fights. Despite my low estimation of your talents, you have survived the battle. Here is your blood spattered reward. Perhaps you require a greater challenge? But you have to hear the exact same line every time after winning a match. A giant Vault Boy statue that cries radioactive goo onto the sacrifices of the ghoul cult. Brutal. The church has religious symbols placed in radiation for a nice touch. Enemies who hit you through walls. Enemies who run off of cliffs. Loss feels half-baked in comparison to Carbon, with fewer objectives and several maps that you can run through without even fighting. Goals you can throw radiation, which is a pretty cool ability not unlike glowing ones in future games. The leader of the ghoul cult broadcasts his insane teachings across the city. This is the best cult ever. Well, I am Rhombus, leader of the Brotherhood Paladins. Had Paladin Rhombus returning from the first game. His power armor is directly inspired by Tactics Power Armor, which doesn't make any sense, but it's a nice reference regardless. In a game named Brotherhood of Steel, you don't meet an actual member of the Brotherhood until you're almost two-thirds of the way through the campaign. This is the only active member of the Brotherhood you meet throughout the entire game. The Ghoul Cult worships and protects a vault somewhere in this region. However, the cult isn't the real threat. The real threat is the mutants. He reveals the existence of a secret vault inside the city the ghouls are protecting and that the mutants are searching for. I am Blake, a horror and an astonishment. The madman leader of a ghoul cult is named Blake instead of something cool like Morpheus. The vault is a trap for eternity, both sacred and profane. None may enter, nothing can leave. Blake reveals the entire cult is centered around stopping anyone from entering or exiting the vault, which is a cool concept for a cult. Blake is voiced by Kevin Richardson, who voiced the Enclave communications officer in the second game. An annoying boss fight follows that punishes you for making a melee-based character. After defeating the leader of the ghouls, you follow Rhombus through the city, and while he has a health bar, strangely nothing happens when it's depleted. Here it is. Ah! Rhombus is in the game for about five minutes before he gets killed by a ghoul kamikaze. There was a fight and an explosion. Half of us got stuck up here turned into rotters. One of the ghouls reveals that a civil war inside the vault caused an explosion that forced half of the population into loss, where they were transformed into ghouls by radiation. It was only logical that Vault Tech had its own vault, where specialists and executives have lived for many years, safely conducting research to benefit the failing world above. In the third act, we travel to a Vault Tech warehouse that contains a secret vault inside of it, called the Vault Tech Corporate Vault, another cool location concept. Cute service robots. Enemies who run into deadly lasers. 
Welcome to the ShopTech computerized trading system, an advanced experimental vending machine to help you get the equipment that you'll need for daily post-apocalyptic living. A Vault Boy hologram that sells you items. The mutants kill many of the Vault Dwellers, and part of the environment is reminiscent of the first game's evil ending. Sequence. Cool three-legged Tesla robots. No! Piss cannon. We have bad feeling about this. Oh. Oh. The design of the Vault Tech turrets is great. A section where you control a service robot like an RC car, giving you a much needed break from hack and slashing everything. In another section, you get to control some turrets, which is again another nice break from the gameplay loop. However, in one section, there are no enemies placed close enough to the turret to actually kill them. An overseer's chair in 3D for the first time. Ah, at last I meet the mouse who stalks lions. I am Attis, a general in the mutant army. And you have something I need, little mouse. More Tony J. He plays Addis, a leader of a band of mutants who are remnants of the Master's army. Addis has a cybernetic replacement of his eye, much like the lieutenant, for a nice tip of the hat. After the unfortunate business with the psycho ghouls, it was easier to let you bring me the key rather than enter a long, drawn-out siege on the city. A confusing reference to cut content, which is just tradition in the series at this point. After winning a quick boss fight against him, you get ambushed by Nightken. Hold fast. You get your arm cut off. Oh my god! Hello? Are you alive? You're found by a vault dweller named Mary, and after she checks on you, you can say, Leave me alone. I'm busy dying. You're forced to slowly walk through an entire level full of enemies while you can't use most weapons. You make it to where the vault's inhabitants live and mercifully get your arm reattached. I'm Patty, the security officer. I took the job of keeping these people safe from the monsters and robots after our old security officer went crazy. You finally get to talk to some of the vault dwellers and Patty is one of the better written characters. Our old security officer, Blake, he claimed that our research was evil and convinced all the guards to fight us. Then there was an explosion, the scientists got stuck here, and the guards had to return to the surface. She reveals that Blake, the leader of the Ghoul Cult and Loss, was the security officer who caused the Vault Civil War, explaining his mundane name and revealing some interesting lore in the process. A healing chamber, but the doctor always tells you that you're hurt even at full health. Your health also automatically regenerates, so I'm not sure when this could possibly be useful. Our work will surely help all the poor freaks on the surface. The game primarily uses a darker color palette, so the garden is a site for sore eyes as well as another cool idea. The concept art for the garden. Welcome to the vault computer system. I am Kalix, an automated intelligent construct designed to maintain this facility. A vault computer that offers to tell you anything about the vault, but you can essentially only ask it a single question. It is an honor for me to meet such a well-preserved specimen. <laughs> oh, forgive me. I am Chin Sung, a weapons researcher for the Vault Tech Corporation. I have devices to sell if you need anything. Ching Sun, the Vault's merchant, is voiced by D. Bradley Baker, who voiced several characters in Tactics and Dr. Braun in Fallout 3. This concept art of a Vault Tech scientist. Oh, yes. It feels so good when you do that. Oh, I'm such a bad girl. Do it again. Yes, yes! Fisto's Grandma. Giant super mutants, they were essentially the predecessor to behemoths in later games. 
Deadly lasers that glitch out and become invisible but still kill you. An eyeball key used to unlock a retinal scanner. Nefarious vault tech experiments. Having to escort a vault technician who easily dies, and a counter showing you how many times he's died. Robot, I'm under attack! He dies anyway after you protect him. An annoying section where you have to move holodisc records around to advance to the next area. You have a mini-boss fight against Nightken, who turn invisible and actually use some degree of tactics. Deathclaws who appear out of thin air. Enemies who just stand there and do nothing. Deathclaws that can turn invisible, a clever ability considering their origin as chameleons. Balls. The design and concept art for the Turbo Plasma Rifle is awesome. Yes, I am the chief scientist for this Voltec facility. My name is Dubois. Scientist who has a stereotypical French accent. Leave me! Go quickly! It's too late! He gets killed immediately. The Deathclaw Queen is just a xenomorph. But she's the first boss that really feels like a legit boss fight, retreating to heal herself in radioactive pulls whenever she takes too much damage. ...and fight for as long as I am able. But... you can't! Alright, good luck. Unreliable roommates. Two mutants are attacking him, but he only shoots one before totally ignoring the other, firing off into the distance before getting brained. You have exceeded your daily quota of balls. The design of the Turbo Super Sledge. Death by Balls vending machine. The power armor helmet looks goofy. Enemies who appear out of thin air. Fighting a Deathclaw adolescent as a boss after the Queen, which is bizarrely much bigger than any other Deathclaw you fight in the entire game. Just how big is a fully grown Deathclaw in Texas? It explodes after dying, but a perfectly preserved body comes out of it in a moment straight out of a B-movie. A, a, a good diet and regular exercise can ensure a happy, healthy life underground. Ground. A message from vault -Tec. Corrupted vault computer. Fertility. That's what we came for. The research in this vault was centered around curing sterility due to mutation. Addis reveals that her plan was to use the corporate vault's research to cure their sterility, which is actually a pretty great plan. Perhaps there is power here. Yes, I can feel it. Following in my master's footsteps, a new type of mutant is born. We will overcome. It doesn't work, however, and begins to transform him into a new strain of mutant, where we get another master reference. A lot of work went into the final boss fight, and he switches between melee and ranged attacks while using evasive movement and turning invisible. After beating him, he explodes, but the pieces of his body infect the entire facility. And it quickly becomes overgrown in an homage to the hallway outside the master's lair. The concept art for the mutated vault. Now the game gives you a message titled, Oh Shit. We will become the perfect army. One flesh, one mind. You now have to fight giant eyeballs and tentacles while Addis reveals his new evil plan to absorb everything into his new monstrous form, creating a unity not all that unlike the Master's plan. In this form he can bite you, making it very difficult to actually win the fight using melee weapons, which is disappointing if you put all your skills into close-range combat. Kill the monster before it eats us! Eating his own henchmen. Before you go, kill me. Don't let it eat me alive.
Patty is being absorbed into Addis and asks you to mercy kill her, finally giving you the option to kill a friendly NPC. From here you activate a nuclear weapon and escape the facility right before it explodes. Designed by Brian Freyermuth, one of the most influential designers of the first game. You unlock three new characters after completing the campaign, each of which has unique advantages. There isn't a space between the Vault Dweller's name on the character select screen.